Good morning and a warm welcome to St. Matthew's United Church in spirit as today we gather to celebrate the Feast of Epiphany, the visit of the wise men to the baby Jesus. I'm very glad that we're able to gather together this day and I invite you to join with me in prayer. Let us pray. God of grace, as we enter into a new year, we invite your Holy Spirit into our lives and into our living to fill us with strength and courage, to guide us gently over each new day, to hold before us the vision of justice and peace. Be with us in this time of worship, we pray, and always. Amen. The first reading this morning continues the story of Jesus' nativity, reading from the Gospel according to Matthew at the second chapter. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and has co have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, the wise men set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. The arrangement is still just as good. Can you hear the Christmas bells? Continuing to read from Matthew chapter 2. 
Now after the Magi had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child, to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and fled into Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. Here's what I wish we had in our scriptures. Joseph and Mary, the Egypt years. Everything that happened after the dramatic escape that's described in the Gospel of Matthew. After the onslaught of Herod's terrifying indiscriminate violence. The panic of that clear presenting danger, the desperation and fear and single-minded focus on keeping their child safe, whatever it takes, whatever's necessary. Because the fear and the focus, that we can understand. Some of us may know it in our bones as surely as the woman pictured in Kanye's famous painting of the Massacre of the Innocents from our own experience of fleeing unleashed violence or evacuating in advance of fire. But I think all of us have had a sense of it, that fear and that focus, from the first months of this pandemic, when we simply didn't know how things were going to be, beyond the fact of a clear presenting danger, and so there was the simplicity of that clarity. The focus could be single-minded. Here's what matters, Here's what doesn't. And if we're going to stay the blazes home, then here's the CERB, and here's the tech, and here's the payroll support, cap the rents. It's all rolled out with breathtaking speed. Here's what's needed. Here's what's right. Fear, focus, clarity, action. That we can understand in contemplating Joseph and Mary's flight into Egypt. Joseph may, as usual, be getting all his updates from angels speaking to him in dreams, but the single-minded urgency with which he and Mary pack up a newborn, toss those plans to return home, and instead do what has to be done to keep the child safe, that we get, the flight into Egypt. But then what? Is this just where they live now? Because sure, it's perfectly possible that during Joseph and Mary, the Egypt years, there are regular weekly updates from angels speaking to Joseph in dreams. I mean, if we're going with the angels speaking in dreams as the medium of communication, then anything's really possible. But on the face of it, at least, according to what we're told about Joseph and Mary, the Egypt years, and the Gospel of Matthew, which is precisely nothing, there's no indication that they ever knew they'd be going back. 
There's no indication that they ever knew they'd get to return. They've been warned about danger, they've escaped into Egypt, and we know that eventually they get to return. But in that space between those sentences in Matthew's Gospel, it actually is months and months. That space lasts months and months, well over a year, and maybe even two. That space between those two sentences in Matthew's Gospel is Joseph and Mary, the Egypt years. And that's what I wish we knew about. Not just the fear and the focus and the flight, but what came next. Because we know that ultimately, they didn't return to Israel and to their home in Nazareth until Herod died. So does that mean that as long as he was alive, the danger remained obvious? Because it's just as possible that in fact, it didn't unilaterally. That there were times when they thought maybe things would settle down back home and they could go back, only to then hear of renewed danger. So how did they cope? How did they approach this sudden refugee status far from home in Egypt? Did they lean into it from the start, assuming it was permanent? It occurred to me in thinking about this story that when we hear about people who come to Canada as refugees, say from a place like Syria, in conditions of violent civil war, we do sort of assume that there isn't ever going to be a time when they can go back. But that demands of those involved a particular mindset, an acceptance of this sudden new normal as permanent. And it'd be quite a different mindset than that which might arise if somehow there remains a kind of lingering hope that it's all just temporary. So did Joseph and Mary lean into it with that kind of mentality of bloom where you planted, Egypt is where we live now? Or were the Egypt years fraught with a kind of constant feeling of being in limbo, up, unrooted, yearning for normalcy and unwilling to say out loud, this is what normal looks like now? We just don't know. And I wish we did. I wish we knew how they managed, how they coped. When the big drama subsided into just, you gotta be kidding me, still? And months and months later, and still? And more months and months later, and seriously? This is really still going on? I wish we knew how they dealt with it. Because they did. Somehow, through all that protracted, exhausting limbo time in Egypt, they kept their hope. They kept their faith. That what was, wouldn't always be. Until, at long last, the angel brings good news. And they can go home. Which brings us to a weird little detail that I don't think I'd really registered before that sets Matthew's Gospel up against Luke's. Because Luke, in his Gospel, he assumes from the beginning that Joseph was already living in Nazareth. Luke has Joseph and Mary traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem for that census that requires everyone to go back to their hometowns. But Matthew doesn't. Matthew, in his Gospel, he lands Joseph and Mary in Nazareth after the flight into Egypt. And Matthew ascribes it not to, be, not to being the obvious place to which they return because that's where they were living before, but instead as the result of one more experience of danger after, in theory, the danger had all passed. The angel brings good news, Herod has died, and so now it's theoretically safe to return, except not so fast, apparently it isn't. And so it's then, Matthew tells, 
tells us in his gospel that Joseph and Mary keep on moving and wind up in Nazareth. It all seems unnecessarily complicated, though it's easily explained by Luke just wrongly assuming that they've been living there in the first place. But I find what it speaks to in this particular moment is something that honestly I find weirdly reassuring in the midst of all this that we're going through right now. Because it could have been, we could have had, a story of the flight into Egypt that's like big drama and fear and focus and action and then it's all over and they come home again, all good. Yes, I could wish we knew more about Joseph and Mary the Egypt years because frankly they were probably exhausting and it'd be nice to know how Joseph and Mary coped with all of it. But it could have been and we would have had just the big danger and then the resolution. All tied up in a bow and it's done. But that's not how the story ends in Matthew. Instead, weirdly, strikingly, there's this one more experience of danger after, in theory, all the danger has passed. Only this time, according to the angel who brings messages to Joseph in his dreams, this time it's all good, that danger, with just some pretty minor precautions. All they have to do is move to Nazareth, and then it'll all be fine. And they do. And we could just stop there. Just recognizing and being str strengthened by how firmly they did keep their faith throughout it all and maintain their hope throughout it all. That what was wouldn't always be. That all things are possible with God and with God all things are possible. But I think there's a word for us here more specifically. In this moment when we're knee deep in one more experience of danger after an exhausting almost two years and after in theory the danger has passed. When just like Joseph and Mary must have done, we're really struggling with how suddenly the past notwithstanding, suddenly, it's apparently all good with just some pretty minor precautions. It had to have surprised them, Joseph and Mary, that sudden shift in risk assessment by that last angel. Trusting and faithful they absolutely were, but it had to have been unsettling, even frightening. It can't have been easy for them to let go of one perspective on a clear and present danger and replace it with a completely different way of thinking about that clear and present danger. As now just a matter for, oh, flight to Egypt? No, just a free, few precautions and relative calm. It must have been hard to just settle into Nazareth like this danger from the new ruler is somehow different from the danger from the old ruler that sent them fleeing across the border into Egypt in the dead of night. Because I'm sure it didn't feel different to them. Not at first. Not when it's a matter of life and death. I suspect it took time. But I do find this part of the story weirdly reassuring. Because where we are right now is at exactly that same moment of being dragged from one perspective on a danger to a new perspective on that danger. And it is hard. But we look at Joseph and Mary and it's doable. It'll take time and we could be forgiven that for wishing that Matthew had included even a line or two of Joseph and Mary, a new start in Nazareth, to give us a sense of how they inched their way from the old perspective on that danger to this new perspective on that danger. But they did. 
They got there. And we will too. With God, all things are possible. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we begin this new year with trepidation. Anxious afresh and caught between familiar precautions and changed policies. Uncertain what's safe and struggling to trust. Help us, as you did Mary and Joseph, to find a way through it all. Hear our prayers for those we love and for all whom you love. For the wellness and well-being of all. For those in hospital and their families. For all in isolation and all who are again locked down. We pray for wisdom in our leaders for caregivers and cleaners, clerks and delivery people, healthcare providers and emergency service workers, teachers and daycare workers. God, we lift to your care all who are spending this season in shelters and tents, in refugee camps and in our own city. Comfort all who are sad or worried for the future. Protect and guide all who are traveling and all who are far from home. Surround and strengthen our families, our neighbors, and our friends, we pray. Loving God, as we begin this new year, Lift our spirits with strong hope and carry us gently. For we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
And now as we go forth into a new year to seek justice and to love kindness and to travel gently together in God's path, let us go forth knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit lift us up and bear us up this day and always.